The talk of the town after the national tournament this year was Penn State went 5-for-5 five five in the finals. Getting one national champ is pretty difficult alone, but to have five is borderline extremely rare, yet Penn State has done it twice and in only a five-year span. There's only been five teams ever to do it across all college wrestling, and it only spans three universities. Penn State twice, Iowa twice, and Oklahoma State once. I thought this was an interesting topic, and of course, this really drives the Gale vs. Kale conversation since they both reached this almost impossible feat twice. So for a while, this video was brewing in my head and it was originally just going to be who's better, Kale or Gable, but more specifically, I was going to compare Gable's best five champ Iowa team versus Kale's best five champ Penn State team. However, I ran into a little bit of a problem. I couldn't really decide which Iowa squad was better and the same for the two Penn State five champ teams. Then I was going to just compare all four of those teams and come to an overly complicated true tank conclusion but then I was like, wait, let's take a look at the 05 Oklahoma State team real quick. And I basically went, wow, that's an unbelievable team too. So then the video fully evolved into what it is today and finally get to the leading question on what exactly is the best five champ team in NCAA history. Like I said, this feat is unbelievably hard to achieve and only the best in the sport can lead a team to this outcome. I mean, we were talking about Dan Gable, John Smith, and Kale Sanderson here. So let's go on a walk down memory lane and talk about some of the best teams in NCAA history. Now just to be specific, I am only going to look at the champs on these teams. I know these teams have had several other great co-stars that were several time All-Americans that went on to have great careers, but this video is only for the champions and picking which team has the best five champs in history. Granted, these Penn State teams, especially this year's 2022 squad, doesn't really have the luxury factor or the legacy factor, so that will make things interesting but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Also, if you are a fan of Iowa, Penn State, or Oklahoma State, I know a lot of my fans are, be sure to like this video or subscribe for future videos like this one and comment throughout with any questions or let me know if any of these teams or wrestlers were one of your favorites. But for now, let's start in 1986 with the Iowa Hawkeyes squad led by the man himself, Dan Gable. Now, before I made this video about every five champ team, it was probably just going to be between the 97 Iowa team and the 2017 Penn State team. But then I looked deeper into this first five champ team, this 86 Hawkeye team, and they seriously gave themselves a chance in the running. I mean, they had Kevin Dresser and Jim Heffernan on the same team, so how could they not be at least considered? Plus, they were the pioneers, the first team to do it, so that can't be taken lightly. Starting with their full lineup of just champs. They had Brad Penrith at 126, Kevin Dresser at 142, Jim Heffernan at 150, Marty Kistler at 167, and wrapping them up with Dwayne Goldman at 190. Penrith was a three-time Big Ten champ, and this year was his only national title. The same can be said for Dresser, except he had one less Big Ten title. Heffernan, who just retired around a year ago from coaching in Illinois, was a four-time Big Ten champ, which, wow, super impressive there, but was also only a one-time NCAA champ champ. Their 190 pounder Goldman wraps up their one time national champs, but he for sure has something interesting and different about him. He was a four time Big Ten champ, and yes that is impressive, but that's not all. He was also a four time national finalist. Yes, and then won it all his senior year, and props to him because his nerves were probably going through the roof. He's like a 1986 version of Dayton Fix. Props to Goldman for finally getting it done, but the star of the 86 team was 167 pounder Marty Kistler, who was a three three-time Big Ten champ and a two-time national champion, along with winning the Outstanding Wrestler Award for this tournament. And rightfully so, he bonus pointed everyone except the five seed from Iowa State, who he probably wrestled during the season and he wrestled here in the semifinals, but he still beat him 9-3, so just a point shy there. I'm sure some of you noticed the theme with that team that might not stick around throughout if you know wrestling history, and that is the amount of one-timers in that Hawkeye lineup. I think it sort of speaks to the era of wrestling at the time where you sort of had to wait your turn to become a senior to win it, but that wasn't always true, but nowadays it just feels like it's all the youngsters coming right out of the gate ready to win a national title, and some of the seniors aren't as good as they used to be, but that's just a small sample size of guys, so no real data to actually support that. But in 86, it for sure was an upperclassman field for the most part. However, upperclassmen or underclassmen, everything aligned for this team, and they were really good. They will always have a special place in the wrestling history books because they were the first to do it. 
So Dan and Gable not only got the first five champ team with all the stars aligned at the right time in a generation of recruits, but he also did it again over a decade later, which is kind of impressive. And Iowa was good during this time, don't get me wrong, but it was a totally different time period for wrestling. And they lost to Iowa State during this 11 year gap, so they weren't always just crushing everyone. Like this wasn't just going to happen eventually. But if the stars came together in 86, wow, just Wow, let me tell you about 97. Iowa had Jesse Whitmer at 118, Iowa celebrity Mark Ironside at 134, Lincoln McCalvary, a celebrity in Iowa himself at 150, Joe Williams at 158, and then there was Lee Foldhart at 190. Interesting, a few similarities there in weights between 86 and 97, but I'm sure that's just a coincidence. It is really key to know for this year that this was Dan Gable's last season, and everyone knew it too. So the fact that he went out with this kind of bang is not only impressive, but also really speaks the idea of peaking at the right time because they had a really lackluster Big Ten Finals performance. No man speaks better that statement than my man Jesse Whitmer. This dude didn't even make the Big Ten Finals, and one better, he didn't even win the Conti Finals. That's right, he placed fourth two weeks before going on to win a national title. Also, to totally add on to the peaking at the right time story, he never really even started till his senior season due to some injuries and, well, it just being Iowa. So, mega props to him for helping Iowa reach history once again. Well, some guys on this list just peaked at the right time. We have mega Hawkeye celebrity Mark Ironside, who seemed to be always performing at his peak and his best. He was a dominant force everywhere he wrestled. He was a four-time Big Ten champ and a two-time national champ, along with winning the Hodge to cap it all off. Mark Ironside might have been an amazing legacy, but Lincoln McAlvery has some even better stats. He not only went on to have a savage freestyle career, but he was also a three-time national champion, along with being a four-time national finalist and Big Ten champion. They also had Joe Williams, who was another three-time national champion, along with being a four-time All-American. However, heading into this NCAA championships, people were kind of questioning him. He lost his Big Ten finals match, which of course was concerning two weeks before NCAAs, but he put that loss behind him and went on to win another NCAA title. Also, I found this on his NIU coaching bio for him. Uh, it says that he was a 10-time Midlands champ, so not sure if that is true, but if it is, dang, that's a pretty impressive and a legacy of dominance. Finally, this 97 team is bookended by another one-time champ in Lee Fullhart at 190 pounds, who won his one and only NCAA title this season. Overall, just based on the credentials of this team alone, it's probably a little bit better than the 86 team, in my opinion. But I will say this, getting four out of the five champs to be one-timers is pretty impressive, where this team, yes, better in 97, but they had some experience for sure. In retrospect, having guys like Joe Williams, Mark Ironside, and Lincoln McCalvary alone makes them an absolute legend of a team. So let's see if any of our next three entries can beat them. Next, we take a trip to Stillwater, Oklahoma to see our third five champ team in the 2005 Oklahoma State Cowboys. And wow, <laughs> I'm going to say that a lot this video, ain't I? Uh, this team has some star power in this sport. Starting off with the amazing Cowboy lineup, we had Zach Esposito, a now assistant coach for the Cowboys. He was a three-time Big 12 champion, winning his one and only national title this year as well in 2005 at 149 pounds, along with being a finalist in 2004. If you thought that was a big name, there was also Johnny Hendricks, their next champ at 165 pounds, who was a four-time All-American, but it only gets better with him being a two-time national champion and a three-time finalist. And yeah, the Mark Perry loss was his senior year in 2006, so ouch, but at least he was part of this team uh, the year before, I guess. <laughs> the amazing list with this Oklahoma State team continues with Chris Pendleton at 174 pounds, the now Oregon State head coach, who was a four-time All-American and both of his NCAA titles in 2004 and 2005 were against one of the best ever in Ben Askren. He was a three-time finalist and his two finals wins were against one of the best ever. So yeah, this is a pretty good 174 resume builder. Also, do you guys see now why I had to include this in the Iowa versus Penn State five champ debate? We are only three weights in and this Oklahoma State team is already an outstanding team from just purely a resume perspective and a name perspective. However, we are only three weights into these five champs. So let's keep moving on to 197 with Jake Rolshaw. Another four-time All-American and a three-time national champion. Man, this team was 
just amazing, man. <laughs> like I said, Rolshot was a three-time champ, and he was also a third-place finisher the only year he did not win at all, so a pretty dang good career for him. Then we wrap things up with the only heavyweight on any of these five champ teams to win it all with the absolute legend in Steve Mako, who we all know was a four-time finalist, taking second his freshman and senior year bookends, but was a champ in between at Iowa in 2003, and then of course when he won at Oklahoma State in 2005. For those who don't know, Mako didn't just leave Iowa because Oklahoma State was that much better, but he left not only because they were amazing on the college scene, but he also left because they were pushing for world and Olympic teams every single year, and their freestyle training was top-notch at the time, so that really attracted him to Oklahoma State. I think his attraction perfectly details how great the team really was. They weren't just training with national champions, they were training with future and current world and Olympic team members. Another thing to help build their case for the best five champ team, Esposito is an absolute legend, and he was technically the worst from a credential standpoint out of these five, only winning one title in his career, which in retrospect, that is really crazy to how great this team really was. So with that said, from a credential standpoint, it's probably hard to beat a team with that many national champs, right? Just purely from a numbers standpoint, right? Well, let's get a little closer to the modern era with the 2017 Penn State team, and I'll revisit that question in a little bit. The most ironic thing about this 2017 Penn State team, and well, the 2022 Penn State team, is a lot of guys I mentioned on the Oklahoma State five champ team, is that a lot of those guys are coaches now, as I alluded to, that are rooting against these teams. So I just thought that was interesting, I guess. Penn State is the last team to date to have a five champ team. They are in their first honor in 2017, and they are the only team to get five in a row, fun fact. Starting with their bonus point machine, Zane Rutherford at 149 pounds. Zane was incredible, like just scary to watch on top. It was like you could feel it through the TV. He beat Logan Steer at 141 his freshman year, and then after that, he would go on to place fifth that season. And then after a gap redshirt season, he would go on to be a three time Big Ten champion and a three time NCAA champion, winning almost every final he was in in a dominant fashion. And also after that redshirt season, he never lost again. He was undefeated his last three seasons in college. His teammate at 157 was very similar, winning three Big Ten championships, and his only losses were to Isaiah Martinez, who he beat his freshman year and then would lose to in the postseason, so very similar to Zane, actually. They both won three NCAA titles, but where Zane looks so dominant on top, Nolf just made the sport of wrestling look so easy, and I've never seen anyone else just be as fluent and make wrestling just look so much fun and be just flawless at the craft. He would beat guys like Ryan Deacon with just pure ease. The next two weights in this lineup are a little interesting, but I will say why as I cover them. We have Vincenzo Joseph, a two-time national champ, his freshman and sophomore year, and in those runs, he beat a two-time national champion twice in the previous mention, Isaiah Martinez. He would lose in 2019 to Virginia Tech's first champ ever and stud Makai Lewis, but in 2017, he for sure came to party in March and stunned the world when he inside trip pinned Imar. Then we move up to 174 pounds, where Mark Hall for sure had a fun year, his opening year at college. Now, we all know Mark Hall was the prodigy coming into college, and he was expected to do great things. However, coming to his first season, he lost a match at his first ever Open. However, moving throughout that year, he got better and better and would smash through the Southern Scuffle, beating several-time Oklahoma State All-American Kyle Crutchman. However, once his red shirt was pulled, they wrestled Iowa and he would lose his first match after getting that redshirt pull in Carver. He would then also lose in the Big Ten Finals in sudden victory to Bo Jordan of Ohio State, but he still had a great resume at this point entering into the national tournament, but he was not the top two seed, so he was not expected to make the finals. However, once he made the semifinals, he had another legend in Zahid Valencia of Arizona State that he would beat by the skin of his teeth, and then he would get revenge on that Big Ten loss where he would win his first national title as a true freshman. Now to lead back to the question why these two are interesting, and it sort of goes back to the unknown legacy factor of these Penn State teams. Mark Hall would make two other finals after this, but would not win, and he would lose to his rival Zahid Valencia twice in NCAA finals. But their senior year was 2020, where they did not get a chance to compete, so there's a lot of unknown questions that will honestly never be answered. In Chenzo's case, he could have been a three-timer, and Mark could have became a two-timer. It would not have been a cakewalk for them by any means. Hall that season was one-on-one -on -one with Michael Kemmer, and Vincenzo lost to Marinelli in the big 
Big Ten Finals, but we'll never know what would have happened. However, what we do know is that they won titles in 2017, so let's finish up this lineup with Bo Nickel at 184 pounds. He was a four-time finalist and a three-time national champ with an impressively high bonus rate, rivaling Rutherford and Noel. He not only won his first title here, but he beat one of the greats in college wrestling and Gabe Dean of Cornell to deny him his third national title, which is kind of ironic that Max Dean would eventually transfer to Penn State and now winning titles there. But the Max Dean situation is neither here nor there. That was a rundown of the 2017 Penn State 5 champ team. I'm sure you all noticed something, but wow, what an impressive lineup of guys. Three of the five were three-timers. Two of them went undefeated after their freshman year, and technically the worst was Mark Hall, who was only a one-time champ, but consistently made the finals and was the one seed entering the 2020 NCAA bracket. However, Kale Sanderson's Penn State team was not done yet, with them doing this amazing feat once again in the 2022 season, or aka the last season we just had. It's so unique to me because this is the team that made me think of this idea for this video. It is also funny because I wonder if these guys remember what they were doing when they watched Penn State do this in 2017, considering it really wasn't that long ago for these guys either. We'll start this lineup breakdown of the 2022 Penn State 5 champ team with RBY. So far, Roman Bravo Young is a two-time national champion and a three-time place winner All-American. I actually remember RBY decommitting from Penn State for a little bit when Gavin Teasdale decommitted from Iowa and said he was going to Penn State after the 2017 Nationals. But luckily, Penn State was able to keep RBY because in the long run, he paid off pretty well, I would say. RBY's style is also very unique. It's almost like he's dancing out there at time and just all of a sudden it's like, boom, something happened. But it's amazing how well he's developed that and matured in the Penn State lineup. Nick Lee at 141 won his second title to end his career in 2022. And funny enough 2017 was the year he took off his senior year to train at Penn State which paid off for him in bunches with him becoming a four-time place winner All-American along with two national titles. Now moving forward in the lineup this is where the legacy comes back into play because the next couple guys have a couple years left to prove themselves and get more national titles or All-American honors. For instance Carter Siraki has the potential to be the only five-time NCAA champ in the history of college wrestling. He already has two NCAA titles both won in OT and he still has has three title runs to go, obviously. Clearly, he made big jumps from his freshman year to sophomore year, and I am pumped to see where he goes from here. The same can be said for Aaron Brooks at 184 pounds, who is a two-time NCAA champ and still has two more cracks to go to become a four-time national champion. Then to wrap it all up, Penn State has Cornell transfer Max Dean, who navigated himself to an NCAA title at the dangerous 197 weight class, and this was his second finals appearance and his first national title to put a stamp on the last five champ team and to close the wrestling history book. Well, that was a walk down memory lane for sure. But who do I think was the absolute best five champ team just looking at the five NCAA champs that Iowa, Oklahoma State, and Penn State can present to us? Well, no offense to the 86 or the 2022 Penn State team, but I think 05 Oklahoma State, Iowa 97, and 2017 Penn State have either too many legends or were just super dominant to compete with. If someone disagrees or has a question on that ruling, uh, let me know in the comment section below. Also, so I'm not saying those two other teams don't have legends on them and I have total respect to those teams. I'm just saying that the three in the running right now are just a little bit better. <laughs> now, if we are just looking at numbers, the 2017 Penn State team easily chips everyone out by a little bit. Now, that's just based off the numbers alone. Now, I know picking one of these teams just based off the numbers alone is kind of or really lame. I know that. Plus, some of you might be saying this is a recency bias, which I can promise you that's not what I'm going with this. And and on that note, we also all saw how incredible that team was. In 2017, being a Penn State fan or not, what they did was incredible. And it wasn't they just won with five champs, they did it in a dominant fashion. Let's just recap their finals and some of their runs from that 2017 tournament. Zane Rutherford tech falled Levon Mays of Missouri in the finals at 149. Jason Nolf major Joey Lavalle of Missouri 14-6 in his final and dominated through the bracket. Same with Zane. Vincenzo Joseph 
Joseph pinned a two-time national champion in Isaiah Martinez of Illinois. Mark Hall beat Tahid Valencia, who would go on to be one of the best of college wrestling in the semifinals, and then avenge a loss from the Big Ten finals over both Joe and of Ohio State. And then Bo Nickel would beat one of the best Cornell wrestlers ever in Gabe Dean 4-3 in the finals at 184. So they had three bonus point wins in the finals, and then the other two went on amazing runs to beat some of NCAA wrestling's best. Now, after just pleading my case, I understand that all the other teams also went on historical runs. And I would also like to say, to pad myself a little bit, is that I think the 05 Oklahoma State team and the 97 Hawkeye team have a brutally close case to be this top team. To put it in islands per se, I would say the 2017 Penn State team is on their own island, but literally just a slither of water away is the 05 Oklahoma State and 97 Hawkeye team, so it is brutally close between those three teams. Now, the 2022 team has a couple guys that could drastically change this perspective, but at the time all these teams wrestled in their respected year and era, I think I have to go with 2017 Penn State. Like I said, if you have a different thought on my opinion, please let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. If you overall enjoyed this video, please also let me know that in the comment section below. And be sure to like and subscribe. This was an unbelievably super fun video to write, research, and e everything. The editing, everything was really fun with this video. So I hope you all really enjoy it as well. And with all that, I really don't have any more else to say. So thank you all for watching True Tan Wrestling content. And I will see you guys in the next one. Take care, everybody.